Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, or oh, is it still morning? Ah, it is afternoon. Uh, so this uh, session of the conference, the penultimate session, uh, has become something of a customary event where we typically reflect on the conference that's passed. Uh, we decided to do it slightly differently this year where our colleague Michael Samuel will reflect on the past 10 years of the Teaching and Learning Conference. Um, Michael? Thank you very much, Robbie. Um, of course, trying to capture 10 years in the amount of time is going to near impossibility. But uh, so you have as a guide for you a document that you see on your chair that might assist you to think through this particular uh, trajectory as we've seen it over the last ten, uh, 10 years. So I, I just want to indicate that I have a set of slides and I was saying to Rabbi, it's very dangerous when you give Michael an opportunity to speak because the slides mean one thing and when I start talking they start meaning different things. So. So immediately I started and started thinking maybe the title for the presentation is incorrect. Really what we are aiming to do is look at the trajectory of how the teaching and learning conference has morphed, has evolved from its original history of trying to talk about um, not BP, the petroleum company, but the best practices uh, uh, agenda that used to characterize the nature of what the teaching and learning conference and we added on to move it to try and start thinking about what is a scholarship of teaching and learning and then as we know this particular conference is now built not under teaching and learning conference but focusing on higher education studies. So I'm trying to map with you what that actually means and given that this is um, a conference that tried to celebrate the, uh, the arts. I'm going to try and celebrate it by the virtue of trying to look at the visual arts and trying to understand how we see the conference themes via the program design covers to begin with. What do we see as we look at the program co uh, cover designs? But if you cast your eyes over the second or the third column of the themes that ran through the conference, you'll notice there's another artistic metaphor that seems to be recurring through all the, the conference titles. Um, and you see words like transforming, innovation, reconstruction, a, a reformation, a comparative dimension, a reimagining. And if you look at all of these words, they seem to be suggesting that we're moving towards constructing a future, not just celebrating a past, but also to be able to say where we're going in the next direction. What's the new directions? And it's interesting that as we make this turn 10 years after running the conference, that the word crisis emerges into the metaphors. Um, it's a crisis of contestations, of contemplations, a crisis of many options and many choices. One of the choices we've made is to move away from teaching and learning to higher education studies. And I'm going to reflect with you whether this option brings about new sets of searching, new sets of unsettling that is going to emerge as a consequence. So let's just look at the conference program of 2009. And um, just to put that in location, it's a conference that looks like a report. Uh, it looks like we're taking stock of something. For the moment, don't concentrate on the theme of the conference, but just look at the visual. The visual tells us that we're dealing with almost an institutional report on this particular issue. As opposed to, as we move in 2010, we move into a program that starts talking about the identity of the institution. 
And I was surprised because we five campuses, but on reflection, there's only three pictures of three campuses there. So it suggests something. There were some exclusions or inclusions being made in the way in which our visual uh, is being constructed. And so what I'm trying to suggest to us, we are being surrounded by visual images that perhaps we don't read often critically enough. And this goes to our conception of what visual literacy is, or aesthetic literacy is, and whether we are able to read these images. So this is the next conference that was held in 2011, in which, interestingly enough, it was held for the first time on the Westville campus. So the image of a building yet occurs. And it's interesting, we're not looking at people in any of these images that we've seen up to now. We're just seeing buildings as metaphors, which suggests something in the way in which we're constructing our identities in the early stages of an institutional identity, an identity that's located to space. It's a location very much to UKZN as a space. As we move on, it's not surprising that when it goes to Howard College, we have Howard College as the image um, that we see in the institutional setting on the cover. Uh, again, a visual literacy. Of course, when you do get a copy of these slides eventually on the UTLO website, see whether you actually look at any metaphor that might be going between the visual metaphor and the choice of the themes about whether there's any correlation between those two things as well. I'm merely presenting a syntax for you to be able to think through this agenda of how images may be constructed. Here's yet another conference, 2013, and you can see the image has shifted from buildings, but it's gone to a particular image from a particular building. This is the mosaic on the library of UKZN, so uh, people familiar with this will know exactly which image where it comes from as a visual metaphor, but of a mosaic. Uh, it's opening up the possibility of the idea of contestation and conflict, and the idea that our building spaces are not monoliths, but they're opening up. They're opening up new artistic ways of reading and rereading the environment in which we engage with. I'm pausing for a moment, I'm not talking about the themes, I'll come to that in a moment, but I'm playing with the metaphors as we e expand. So the next one is an image that brings into play a set of images regarding African symbols. And it's no surprise that Africanization debates are what dominate in the thematic concerns as well. So I don't know which came first, the themes or whether the image followed thereafter, but what we can see here is an attempt to move beyond just simply talking about the edifices of the institution, but also start talking about the people and the cultural symbols that they bring into the space in which they occupy within the overall goal of a scholarship of teaching and learning beginning to emerge as we see it. The next interesting visual image of the next conference, 2015, presents us with the painting, and it's interesting, it's a painting by Randir um, Rautla, who's a chemical engineer, am I correct? Yeah, so a chemical engineer drawing us a painting for an image uh, for, for the cover of the design of the program of UTLO's Teaching and Learning Conference. And if we examine it, it's putting the epistemological question into bear. How are we drawing on codified knowledge which surround us in the form of books? And it, again, in the center of the image is an image of a woman, so it's asking questions of both identity and epistemology, emerging as the thrust that underpins our agenda as we move forward. Not all of us like the image, so I'm told, but nevertheless, it opens up some new images around 
the contestation about identity and epistemology and our pedagogy of higher education. Now, some of you might think I'm crazy, but what I'm adding in here is our visual metaphors define our spaces, our epistemologies, our ways of thinking. So let's have a look at what goes on as we move into a more technologi technologized environment where no longer painters draw, but graphic artists draw. They create images, and I'm wondering whether that image got downloaded from the internet <laughs> or repositioned and whether copyrights were sorted out and etc. But what it does, it reinforces the debate on the metaphor of knowledge, the metaphor of books and images, but what we see in the center of the image is an image of growing from inside to bring light. Um, and you can see a, an image that what this is suggesting to us, that our conference is not about our buildings, our institutional heritages, but also the heritage of what we bring from inside our, of ourselves in the bringing of light in the engagement of a conference. So it's suggesting conferences are about more than capitulations to institutional agendas, but also about individuals who create the light. Um, this was the poster designed to attract you to this particular conference, and it was crafted in the space, no doubt, by the image you see on the bottom right-hand corner. And you can see how the social context of fees must fall and contestations and protests were forefront in the designers of this image. That part of the images, maybe this suggests that the contestation is coming from students. Okay? That the challenges about what higher education is or could be is coming from students via a kind of protest action. Um, it's historically linked, so you can see this image uh, suggests to us that kind of contestation. But if you look at your program design, what came to be designed as the cover for the 2011, sorry, the, the 11th conference of this organization, and you can see the student is still there, but what's added into are other kinds of symbols of institution, of technology, of uh, people, of we have a nuclear uh, image there of the atom structure. We have debates around methodologies in the form of a magnifying glass. Uh, we have calculators. Is this suggesting that we're moving into a more quantitative environment? What is this image actually suggested? But this image is held together on a time bomb, okay? You can see it's got a short fuse in, in this, and it's suggesting something to us about the nature of what we're doing. I hope what I'm doing in looking at these images is asking us what kind of cultural symbols do you surround yourself with in the higher education environment? And that our conferences reflect these kinds of images as well as create the society and the context within which we live. So I'm going to now look at, have a look at these other, the, the titles of which called papers to this conference. It's listed on your page in the last, in the middle section of the folder that I've given you. That constitutes the variety of issues that emerge as the call for papers in 2017. And what I'm going to try and do with you is map backwards to be able to say how many of these ideas are actually new. When do you think the idea of technology first got mooted? Have a look through the images for yourself, okay? But we're gonna go backwards and say, when did ICT emerge? When did the debate about language emerge? 
when did data analytics emerge as a construct? Um, if we're looking backwards across the conference. But that's where we are as the, the call for papers for this particular conference. Note the last image is reclaiming the call for performing arts. Each conference attempted to highlight a particular discipline or field. We've had health sciences, we've had humanities, we've had a higher education, we've had postgraduate education as different images, but this year it's on performing arts. Have we indeed walked away with a new image about performing arts as a consequence of this conference? So I just want to trace that this is 1994 in our first democratic elections. Ten years later, UKZN established its, itself as an amalgamation of five different universities, the merger, but the first conference only happens three years later. And notably, this conference was organized by what was then called Student Access. It was very, at that time, a focus on the issue of admission into the university. Who's coming to our university post-merger? But look how many years after 1994 this becomes as a discussion for how is this influencing our pedagogy? The UTO office, University Teaching and Learning Office, gets established in 2008, and then it hosts the remaining conferences, number three to number 11, nine conferences under Rabbi's auspices, and this one being the 11th one, indicating that we are hosting a conference under the auspices of a formalized structure to look at the pedagogy of teaching and learning. And so it's not surprising that teaching and learning is the agenda of this particular conference. But last year, it was mooted that we need to move away understanding this particular conference as an institutional conference, but rather that this is a national conference and then even further to extend that this is not a matter of only our individual best practices at UKZN and a celebration of what we do or a critique of what we do, but how are we theorizing what we're doing and moving it into an epistemological terrain? So in 2011, the argument is that we're shifting towards a national a, a, a new discipline or an emerging discipline in the South African terrain or an emerging field of higher education studies. And as Bala indicated in the opening, we can see the merging between what was previously regarded as teaching development agendas, the TGG grant, teaching development grant, which sponsored a lot of the studies that came to be reported in the earlier conferences towards now asking how do we marry research and the TDG agenda. Now that has been happening over the years, but what we see is a question therefore, who should be the custodian then to host a higher education studies conference? Where should it be located? How should it be located? Um, should it be even located institutionally at UKZN. Can you see what I'm doing? I'm disrupting the questions about how we move forward. I put this up to give you an indication of what I'm calling epistemic colonialism in the way in which you can see which institutional space dominates as the space within which, which has led this conference up to this day. I think so. Maybe the three blue indications suggest to us that this has a strong education focus, um, a pedagogy focused, a view about the nature of, uh, the high, uh, of uh, studying the, um, the act of teaching and learning perhaps from an educational point of view coming from the school of education or the faculty of education earlier on. But it shifted over time to different campuses. In four, five, and six, you can see the attempt to move beyond just an agenda of only education. 
The ninth conference indicated a shift to move it off campus. And partly that had to do with it not being owned by any one campus or one set of disciplines, but spanned across different disciplines. But this introduced a major change in the scale of the conference. And what we saw as a consequence from 9, 10, and 11 is a, a large increase of institutions other than UKZN who then begin to participate in the conference. The increasing number of delegates from across the national system and now, as was indicated by Rabi in the opening, a large number of delegates equally now being attracted from the international terrain. So as we move to a more, may I say, hospitable environment or more comfortable environment, suddenly uh, Durban Beachfront becomes attractive. Is this academic tourism or is this really about interest in opening up the scholarship around the notion of what we're engaging with? So you can see that the composition of the conference itself shifts via where you put the conference to be hosted. So here's the recurrent theme that emerges through all the conferences, all 10 presentations. I looked through all the themes and the, the titles of the conference papers, at least. To, and I've had the fortune of being able to reflect on many occasions on the closing session on what each conference was about. But what we might see is a recurrent theme, despite any kinds of changes, an attempt to keep our agenda to pedagogic action. What's working pragmatically? How do we work collaboratively? Are there disciplinary signatures in the nature of our actions? But also, as we move forward, we start seeing a borrowing and a blurring and a crossing over from these disciplines and fields as people start to work more collaboratively beyond departmental agendas. So we see here people start asking questions not just about action, pedagogic action, minus a paradigmatic question. Asking questions about whether in pharmacy we engage with this particular set of actions because they're rituals, habits, or routines, or is it epistemologically based? And so I'm not just talking about your context, Vasha, but I'm talking about any other kinds of context that um, the disciplines begin to ask questions, how did I choose my routine? Where did that routine come from? Whose interests are being upheld via the routine that I'm choosing. And the routine is paradigmatic, is content driven, is also as we methodologically driven. A recurrent theme from conference one. So if you look at your handout, you'll notice that ICT is not something that arrived in today's keynote presentation. ICT was actually here many, many years ago, in fact, at the founding conference. The theme of the conference is innovative teaching technologies. So ICT has been at the forefront, but the question is, are we moving on that agenda 11 years later, 10 years later? Um, how are we translating those issues about multiliteracies, about multilingualism, about innovative teaching? So the scholarship that needs to be emerging is to critique this vocabulary of recurrent themes. To be able to say, are we just saying the same things over and over again about the challenges to our own pedagogy? Or is it that the individuals participating are learning a new vocabulary of how to challenge the rituals? So the research has to take on a more systematic rather than descriptive agenda is the challenge that I'm suggesting as we move forward. That uh, this isn't a space just to celebrate um, the actions of our pedagogy, our pedagogic action, but also to critique and be able to develop a, vo a, a way of thinking multi-paradigmatically, non-ritualistically, and then moving towards enhanced practice, not just of action, but on reflection and critique 
as we move forward. And certainly that has been a very strong presence in the keynote speakers and the presentations, at least the ones that I attended. So it's not just about enhancing practice that we need to be looking at. We should be asking the question, what are kinds of institutional actions that should be engaged, understanding these sorts of issues? And over the 10 years, we've seen increasingly an agenda that says, my pedagogy is not just an internal matter, it's an institutional matter. It's a matter that, enable, that is enabled or constrained by the character or the ethos of the environment within which I practice. And so staff capacity, promotion trajectories, curriculum planning issues become increasingly on the agenda of the teaching and learning conference as it mutates. So the scholarship moves to ask kinds of questions and the papers start asking, how is massification influencing our decision making? How is capacity building in research and scholarship of teaching and learning? And you can see in the themes, the words move to a scholarship of teaching and learning as a new mantra that begins to emerge into the system. So the critique here is that we could get embroiled with institutional bashing, um, critiquing the systems that enable, uh, constrain us from acting the way we do. Um, I am inclined to ask the question whether we can shift that agenda to be asking about the practices we choose, the institutional choices we're making, are serving particular interests. And whose interests are those? Um, for example, we might think that ICT is neutral and the best thing since sliced bread and everybody should be adopting it, but aren't we capitulating in the ICT agenda to a hegemony of particular kinds of worldviews, because behind it lies a very strong econometric agenda. Who owns the computers? Who owns the hardware? Who owns the technology? Who owns, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Or can we recreate it? That's the challenge that I think we need to be asking. It's not just simply an imitation of what the globalized world would like us to think is innovation, but really to start questioning whether we also become servile to the world of Google, to the world of Wikipedia, to any of the kinds of technological apparatus that we may import into our, tech, into our teaching and learning spaces. It's not neutral. It serves particular interests, and perhaps the interests of capital above the interests of pedagogy or scholarship. Okay, so how are we making these discourses public is the agenda that I'm suggesting we move as we critique institutional agenda. So critique our past actions, not just celebrate them. So at a macro level, we see a shift moving in the agenda of trying to understand, to link our social action as educationists to a broader context, to be able to ask questions like these, redress, access, relevance, how are we being interconnected into the dialogue between indigeneity and Africanization and decolonization? And all three of them mean different things. I think there's a tendency to romanticize the, no the notion of indigeneity as a looking backwards to the past rather than indigeneity about the celebration of the self and its own understandings of the world and how it moves itself forward. I feel a lot of the discussions about indigeneity that I was hearing even in this conference was about boundary wall building rather than dialogical relationships across indigenous spaces. Um, how are we influencing, using the indigenous world 
to move into new territories, dialogically rather than defensively. So I want to ask the question about indigeneity, and I'm sure this will spark off the next conference, the debate around, is our conception of indigeneity a masked attempt to be complicit with preserving what we had in the past? And in doing so, how is this no different from apartheid of cultural boxes and cultural entities with tightly bound contexts? So you can see I'm provoking us to say, as even we look at these new contestations, be careful that our contestations are not masked dialogues about something that happened in the past and that we might be cementing and being complicit in upholding powers that we unconsciously attempt to erode. Um, so, boundary crossings, redefinitions, disruptions are what I'm suggesting is the new era. And disruption is not a negative consequence or not a negative idea. It's to be able to ask where are you drawing your theoretical and epistemological worlds from in order to move forward. The disruption is not an anti-establishment, but it's asking how are we bringing into dialogue the varieties of kinds of signatures that have emerged in our world. So I'm drawing on Mignolo's concept, which came from last year's conference, of talking about untangling the threads of Eurocentricism of moving away to what one speaker called epistemic disobedience, of being consciously being disobedient. And we saw in one of our speakers, in our keynote speakers, was deliberately being disobedient to the existing worldviews as a demonstration of what it means to be epistemically disobedient. And disobedience is not a negative, just like disruption. Disobedience is a way of contestation of moving us forward to be able to reimagine how to sit beyond what we currently habituate. So, so it's a way of moving out of a kind of romanticization and an essentialization of how the solutions are to be found. The solutions are to be find, found in this contestation, in this dialogical um, disobedience. Um, so it's about crafting the future. Um, our agendas are not just simply romanticized celebrations of the past. Uh, it's about crafting our future. So are these separate? I don't think so. I think best practices are embedded in, or pedagogical action, are embedded in the institutional action that we're aiming to engage and also embedded within the macro agenda. So they might appear discrete in the color bands that you can see, but I'm suggesting that we could be asking whether some of them celebrate the past, celebrate the future, or celebrate the present. And as we're moving forward, that's what we need to be talking about, robust, resilient, and responsive argument to be able to dialogue the future, um, aware of the tensions and the contradictions and the paradoxes as we move forward. So the shifting trend I am hearing more and more in the agenda of how to keep the customers satisfied, okay? And it sounds like we're in McDonald's uh, in the process. Um, the customer satisfaction discourse is emerging under a disguise of being called celebrate the student experience. And now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we should not pay attention to what students are saying. I'm saying if you believe that the students alone have the right to define and defend and suggest the way we need to move forward, this is a capitulation as well. The customer wants fast food, so let's give him fast food. Commodification begins to creep into the agenda. And 
I'm also challenging the idea of whether we're moving into university spaces becoming more and more therapeutic spaces where we're trying to mollycoddle and not offend anybody and trying to be polite to each other and not contesting and challenging. So even academics are beginning to get silenced. So I'm calling that the silenced professor, where professionals are increase, increasingly stopping themselves from opening out and saying what is it that they don't agree with. Um, and so should we give students what they want or what the system wants or what they need and how do we determine this? And so do not disguise the idea that quality education is just about making life easier for students. If you make it harder, you might be doing them a better service. Michael's view. Be careful we don't become complicit in dumbing down our curriculum just to make everybody happy and they pass through the system. Don't become so obsessed with, the obsession of, with an obsession of pass rates and throughput rates because you might also become complicit in the agenda of sidelining the knowledge project of what higher education could be. And as we suggest in this presentation, you might be complicit in preservation and may be masked in some kind of symbolic violence against the knowledge project. So we should be working beyond McDonaldization. We should be thinking about our spaces of higher education as beyond just simply a customer satisfaction era. Always asking the question, whose interests are being served by the present offerings we offer? So, over the years, you can see there's been three trends in the, and now on the back page of your handout is a diagram indicating what I'm seeing as the thrust of the agenda as we see in them over the three years, uh, sorry, over the 10 years of this conference. Three agendas from 2006 to 2018 in the future, a strong agenda of a practice-led and recurrently, if we had to count up the number of presentations on these issues, languages, African languages, curriculum debates, pedagogical debates, ICT, scholarship of teaching, that has been a recurrent theme all the way through. But if you read with me across on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you will see as we go down this particular chart, how the agenda gets pulled in different directions from different sides as we move to the future towards higher education studies. So, look at what was the discussion in the early 2009 conferences, 2010 conferences. And you can see, again, what's emerging is the tension of issues around the identity of the university, the identity but that is being challenged not only from the best practices notion, but also being challenged from a policy broader national perspective. What does it mean to be academically literate? What does it mean to be talking about a diverse student population? The discourse shifts in the next few conferences to debate the issue of internationalization and differentiation. So the, it's systemic issues that begin to come onto the agenda. And as we see here, the debate, I don't know whether to put African scholarship on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side, but it could be both. Is it a policy-led discussion or is this a philosophical-led discussion of what Africanization and African scholarship means? By the way, these are just the headings of the themes that you see in the handout that you have pulled out and extrapolated student access issues, funding issues. It's not a 2016 debate that we start talking about funding. Look how much earlier in the conferences the debate about funding in higher education began. Long before fees must fall emerged onto the scene, we were debating funding and we still didn't resolve it. So Adam Habib made a comment in his 
opening address, if you remember, to one of our conferences, if you attended. Academics have tried for many, several years to try and get the agenda of fees must fall or agendas of funding in higher education, and students overnight brought this to a national agenda. So you can see the debate of, are we wasting our time here talking? Should there be another kind of action that's going on? I don't know. I'm just provoking you. So IKS begins to emerge also as a philosophical terrain, Africanization, the student experience. There's one conference that was held on postgraduate education. It's very interesting that most of our understanding about the higher education system has tended to be on undergraduate education. But you can see, I was pleased to note that the presentations that I'm attending in this conference equally says that we're not only talking about undergraduate production, we're also talking about the quality of scholarship that's emerging in postgraduate. So, agendas continue, but they grow. But you can see what we're seeing is a tension between the core identity pulling and pushing in different directions, from a policy-led agenda to a philosophy-led agenda. Higher education studies cannot become bedfellows with only one side of this debate. Um, if we talk about higher education studies, it cannot be only on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side or on the practice-led agenda. Higher education studies, by definition, is all embracing of all of these issues in contestation with each other. So it allows us a family of issues, a scholarship about higher education, a scholarship in higher education, a scholarship by higher education practitioners, or in the space of higher education, or studies for, or studies from. I'm changing the preposition just simply to suggest that the scope of what is higher education could become quite diverse and quite a large family of issues. And as we see this, there are competing agendas already about what is this new emerging field called higher education studies. Are we to capitulate to the national reports would push us in that direction? Are we to be holding ourselves up as the benchmark of imitation of the ICT world in the, in the dominant West or of the dominant kinds of discourses of knowledges that parade as universalist? Are we asking ourselves how we're producing our own scholarship? What about the kinds of topics that our students and we ourselves as researchers choosing to become part of the agenda? What kinds of journals are we creating in order to activate the new directions of a new emerging field, higher education studies in South Africa? How do we forge this agenda in this conference space to move us from subtle scholarship of teaching and learning to a higher education studies discourse? So, Different organizations are pulling and pushing us in different directions. So the Academy of Science pulls us in one direction. The Council on Higher Education pulls us in yet another direction, maybe the same, maybe different. But you also get different kinds of collaborative networks that start to emerge by different institutions. And it's interesting that the scholarship is being published by a very small set, and I'm just using higher education studies here, a very small set of institutions are actually publishing books around higher education studies. Uh, where's the historically disadvantaged institutions in this conference? And why is their participation not noted? Um, how and why is this the nature of the higher education studies conference? that it only chooses, or individuals from certain kinds of institutions choose to participate in it. Why not others? 
Okay, this is just my partial view of the contestations that lead us forward in terms of higher education. So there's many options for the future. We are emergent families of different fields, different disciplines, different approaches, different foci. But it's not just a polyglot postmodernist mix. I think we need to be making choices. We need to be making choices. And for me to conclude is to say, I don't think we should lose our focus on best practices, but we should not just be celebrated, celebratory. I don't think it's only about creating the kind of research spaces for scholarship of teaching and learning to emerge so we can have publication outputs on the agenda. I think it's an opportunity to really define higher education studies as an emerging field. What does it mean to be a member of a higher education environment in the knowledge project? So, it's not about management. It's not about policy. It's not about funding and regulatory discourses only. It must be the dialogical relationship between all of those elements that I've described in my presentation. So with that, I hope that gives us some sense of a future direction for who hosts the next conference on higher education studies and how we craft the agenda for such. Thank you very much. So Michael, if I could ask you to join me here. We have a few minutes, I would say no more than 10, uh, to have the audi audience engage us. Uh, thank you for that masterful mapping. Um, I, I, there's no way I could have done that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, it, yeah, you feel at liberty to interrogate the presentation or interrogate us or interrogate yourselves. Uh, what did you see? What, you, what did you not see? And what would you like to see in the future? So the floor is open. I see a hand there. Freddie, yes, go ahead. That's Dr. Governor. Michael, thank you very much for the uh, presentation and clarity. Um, I, I very much like your model on the micro, meso, and the macro. And, um, and I think for me, two issues come to the fore in the macro is the social action. And being at university for the last 15 years, there's two evidence that come to mind. One is when, uh, when the staff of UKZ went on a strike for six weeks. For me, that, that seemed to be, I felt I was in the right place at the right time. But after that, you brought in the voice of the Professor Simon, and from then onwards it was going downhill in terms of Professor Simon. So I, I felt that I was actually, we were shifting terrains at the university, not the place that I wanted to be at. Also, uh, the other major one, social action, was students' uh, of, uh, of fees must fall. So for me, those are the two major things that really made me think a lot about our place at university. But the concern that I want to throw back maybe to Robbie and to others, uh, it's about teaching and learning, it's about the, our perspective of uh, education. But something is missing, the students' voices all these 10 years. And coming up, I mean, we know that the students are involved, but somehow we have not brought in the students, except, of course, those who are doing postgrad studies, we brought them in, maybe they are, uh, they, they are with us, so maybe they might not voice uh, opposition to anything that we go along with. But I think we need to move maybe to an international trend, bringing more students into this conference, and that's my take on that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Freddie. Uh, chats? Thank, thank you, Michael. I think, you know, you had a very difficult task. I really admire the way you pieced together what you had. You know, that's like composing a symphony for me. I think you did a great job there. Uh, you raise a very important point about uh, indigeneity. And I think it's something that needs uh, revisiting. You know, I am of the view that the process of indigenization in South Africa uh, started with the Land Act, 1913. When the Boers were actually granted the republic, they invested all the en energies into indigenizing. They, no, they cut their ties off from any colonial power, and I think that process was really fast-tracked in the 1961 Republic, where you know, they embraced modernism and pushed indigeneity to another envelope. I think it's, 
it, it's important that you've, uh, that you've raised that and flagged it as how we actually look at indigeneity. There is a danger by associating this with the apartheid state because that was part of the agenda to also you know, craft a state that was a sort of lumpen republic for themselves. Uh, I agree with you on the point uh, about how indigeneity becomes, becomes contested here. The problem that I'm finding for myself is that there is constantly a confusion between what is traditional and what is indigenous. When I see indigenous, I always have this picture, I'm a musician, so I'm thinking visually as well, of a Marsian coming down to earth and taking a photograph of what's going on in Durban. And for me, what's going down in Durban is indigenous to Durban. What are all the things am I seeing in Durban? That for me would be indigenous. So I could be wrong with this, but those, that's my perspective. So I think, the, I'm not saying it's a double-edged sword, but indigenization is something we're gonna have to engage with. Thank you. Thank you for that, chat. Uh, got Nena Amin here. So this, is, this is just a comment. Um, I'm wondering why we often do not think of um, publishing as action. Okay. Are there any other co questions, comments? Michael, do you want to respond to any of those? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they are responses, but just to say this opens the invitation of what we need to be developing. Um, so if I go to Nad's comment about uh, the issue of the silence professor in in a indigenous, sorry, in an institutionalized space, and how that has actually marginalized certain voices out of the vocabulary, if you so to speak. So I think um, the opening up of our, our institutional spaces to hear the voice of professors rather than be silenced to capitulate to one way of thinking, I think that will generate all sorts of debates and theory, theorization. For me, it's important that we need to develop more theory, theorization of indigeneity. Um, and as I agree with uh, Chats, that the, there's a kind of strange understanding that indigeneity equals a romantic past that needs to be preserved and protected and bounded and gifted. Um, and I think herein lies the problem of our model and our theory of indigeneity. So I was in a presentation and Faith Ruffin writes in this area and I was saying we have an obligation to write so I want to endorse uh, um, Nena's idea that scholarship of writing equally is a way of being able to be active or activist. Um, my concern is if you look at the people who are publishing and where they come from, it's also reflecting the power relations that we have in the society at the moment. Uh, and therefore we have to be finding other ways of how do we bring uh, a wider variety of individuals uh, to be able to come to influence the publishing agenda, uh, whose voices are heard, whose contestations are heard. Um, and it's, it's got to do with my comment and I'm underlining, why don't we see more people from institutions other than the big five in the, in, in UK, in, in the South African landscape? Uh, why aren't we seeing this dialogue equally happening in those spaces? Or is this a, a, I don't know, particular kind of conference where that discourse and those debates in those contexts, and note I'm using them you know, all in inverted commas, why aren't those agendas co-constructing the dialogue? So no answers, just provocations for what you're going to be able to bring to the next conference. And I think we have to leave it there. You'll agree that Michael has perhaps the most difficult task in this conference. Every year, he dutifully, faithfully, and masterfully pulls it all together. Oh, okay. Michael just reminded me that I should advertise something. <laughs> so this is a book that uh, Michael and Nena, I mean, and I edited. Uh, it's called Disrupting Higher Education undoing cognitive damage, coming from three people who are cognitively damaged. 
The book has its roots in one of our earlier conferences, in fact, the 2015 uh, conference, um, in which we invited Gayatri Spivak, uh, who introduced us to the notion of cognitive damage, which gave us a vocabulary in which to think about what we were doing and what we were not doing in curriculum transformation, curriculum reform, and rethinking curriculum for the 21st century. So it's a collection of 17 chapters uh, from uh, scholars uh, around the world and uh, UKZN scholars as well. Um, and I, I would think that it's a, it's a useful read for those of us contemplating uh, curriculum change. Um, I want to, on your behalf, thank Michael Samuel. He's been an immense pillar of strength to me for these past 10 years. Um, yeah, I, I really couldn't have achieved what I have with, without his brotherhood and support. very warm UKZN welcome to you to this our 11th annual higher education conference and we've gathered here for the next three days to share our thoughts and insights on the theme of the conference higher education today crises contestations contemplations and futures conference of this kind is extremely useful because it brings together so many diverse people onto one platform, which would not have been possible. So this conference just takes a new format and a new focus. It will continue about education, but instead of a tight focus on teaching and learning, it will be on higher education, which opens the possibilities for debating on more relevant issues or inserting other issues. So I'm looking forward to the new take. The problem of not looking at the evidence and not engaging with it is very problematic in the country. Yeah, I was very in, impressed with the way in which the conference opened up new agendas, especially from um, new agendas of music, performing arts, arts education, into the dialogue about quality and curriculum development and relevance. This is one of those conferences where they're very kind of alternative uh, speakers speakers who are thinking and uh, exposing us to new ways of teaching and thinking about teaching. few last closing words from me, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't want to repeat Michael's brilliant mapping of, of the years gone by, uh, but I do want to briefly um, impose a personal narrative reflection on, on what he's described um, in how the, the conference evolved over the years. So in 2009, I took up my position as Director of Teaching and Learning. And uh, I was asked, as one of my responsibilities, to take over what was then a conference and access, as Michael indicated. It was a 50-person conference, UKZN. Um, and I said, yes, I will take over the conference. 
on certain conditions. And one of the conditions was that I would immediately have to open up the conference to firstly being a multidisciplinary conference and secondly opening it up to delegates beyond UKZN. And I resolved at that stage that within three years the conference would be a national conference and within five years it would be an international conference. We achieved the latter outcome within four years. And we were able to achieve that outcome uh, because of support from various sources, various entities, various individuals, including the Council on Higher Education and the Department of Higher Education and Training. As Michael indicated, they funded this conference quite generously because they saw the prospect of the conference being a driver to fuel the, the scholarship of teaching and learning and to elevate the status of teaching and uh, the status of teaching in higher education uh, alongside research, which was receiving far more attention and prominence and support. So, uh, and I, I attribute the success of the conference to to various individuals. Uh, too too numerous to mention uh, in the short time that I have, but I want to recognize a few people with your permission. Firstly, I want to recognize our former DVC Teaching and Learning, Professor Renuka Vital, who gave me the space, the autonomy, and the freedom to shape the conference around my interests, my inclinations, and my aspirations. And I, I, I had the, the freedom to do this uninhibited. For that, I thank her on your behalf. I want to thank our current uh, acting DVC, Professor Bala Pillay, who unfortunately could not be here today, uh, for continuing the tradition of allowing autonomy and freedom. Then there are various individuals within the teaching and learning office, actually not various, we are a very small office. Um, you wouldn't believe how small we are actually. Um, there's Reshma Subey, whom you all know, our institutional researcher. And she cowers and cringes when her name is mentioned. But she is, is just an amazing uh, person, a uh, human being, and a highly competent institutional researcher. And I'm privileged to be able to uh, develop ideas, share it with her, have them refined. And what you see is a product of that kind of engagement. Of course. And she's recently... Um, graduated with a PhD. Then there's the other tower in the office, uh, Collier Ogle. Collier, are you here? She, she's the other coy one, escapes the attention. Uh, she's our conference manager. She takes care of all the logistics. Um, she holds together the, the conference team, does the programming, and a range of other things are required to make a conference a success. There's um, our finance minister. The outgoing minister was um, Nonremiso Kele, who, who is now uh, a full-time student, um, about to register for a PhD. She started out in my office as the finance administrator. Uh, and so uh, one, of, one of the requirements of working at UTLO is that everybody studies, whether you are an administrator or you already have a PhD. It's an obligation you have to the university community to be in a constant state of renewal. So the other person who's taken over from, not, from uh, Nondemiso is Christina. Are you here, Christina? Say hi, Christina. Uh, Christina is our new finance minister, and she will be registering shortly for a master's degree in commerce. Um, there's Silindile, who is a familiar face to most of you. And you will know Silindile to be an amazingly competent and efficient uh, events coordinator. Uh, somebody who takes personally the mission to ensure that we are comfortable 
and well fed. You will agree. <laughs> then we have a small uh, a group of interns, um, the foot soldiers, if you like, uh, who take care of the little things that have a big impact. We have Abdul, Badru. Badru, where are you at the back? Badru is our IT man. There's Marco Botza, the, he's the generalist in the office, the master of all. And then we have Akwea Lukele, another generalist in the office. Okay. Uh, and of course, uh, I want to also uh, acknowledge all of the interns um, over the years. Uh, we have one of the most successful internship programs at UTLO. Each year we take in up to four new interns and within 12 to 18 months these interns are placed in jobs. Uh, I want to, I want to say also a huge thank you to the media team uh, who've been here and, and the quality of, of their offering speaks for itself I'm sure. And there are a number of people I want to I want to thank here. Jasper Cecil. Jasper, are you here? Oh, Jasper is. <laughs> Incidentally, Jasper Cecil is also a project manager for UTEL, which is UKZN Technology Enhanced Learning Project. Um, which, in fact, Jasper is pre preparing a video which he will share with you, inviting you to. Um, convert your teaching and learning materials to e-materials. So that will reach you soon. And Jasper's team, um, including, okay, so this is in no particular order, this is the media team. There's Tintin, our loyalist. Bogani, Ruben, James, Njibulo, Vishnu, Lungani, Albert, and Siabonga. Uh, these individuals don't keep office hours. They hear weekends, long into the evenings, and early, early in the morning. Thank you, gentlemen. And then to the conference committees and abstract review committees, which constitutes a large number of, of academics who selflessly give up their time every year and to graciously, um, with no reward, of us, their professional services. Um, they are the ones who assure, ensure that uh, the intellectual project is maintained and sustained with the requisite quality. Thank you to that team. So, in 2008, this was the Teaching and Learning Conference was the only conference in the country. Um, and the DHET was one of our early, early, early guests at the conference. And they earmarked, or rather they identified the UKZN conference as the standard bearer and encouraged other universities to follow suit. And they made funding available to, through the Teaching Development Grant. And Fortunately, today, just about every institu institution in the country has an event to showcase teaching and learning, either in the form of a colloquium, uh, a teaching and learning week, uh, or a symposium, etc. And so this prompted us to initiate another evolution in the teaching and learning conference trajectory. And as mentioned by Michael and, and Nena, in the, in the video, we wanted to transcend the exclusive focus on teaching and learning and to embrace a broader, uh, embrace the many broader con concerns facing higher education while retaining teaching and learning as one of the sub-themes. And so I resolved while m making this, this transition that it was time for me to exit, that after 10 years as chair, 
a minute longer could only be counterproductive to the new agenda. Um, and of course, uh, we, we have a, a tradition in Africa where people don't leave. So in, in closing, ladies and gentlemen, I want to, to read uh, the last paragraph of a message that I've written in the handbook, uh, which reads, um, teaching and learning continues to enjoy prominence as one of the themes in an ever-expanding continuum of crises, contestations, contemplations, and futures characterizing higher education today. It has been a singular privilege to have served as chair of the conference, and I am particularly grateful for the opportunities through the keynote addresses, plenary sessions, workshops, and presentations to have gained deep insights and creative solutions to the multitude of problems and opportunities in higher education. I will cherish the many experiences I've enjoyed through partnerships, networking, and collaboration with colleagues from all corners of the globe. As I prepare to hand over the chair to my successor, I want to pay tribute to the distinguished scholars and researchers who have elevated and deepened the debates around higher education and enriched my life in the process. I thank you very much. I think it will be remiss of us not to be able to join conference, to be able to, Rabbi, you have to stay, <laughs> to be, it would be remiss of us not to all actually stand and congratulate somebody who's done 10 years of service to a wonderful agenda. So, well done, Rabbi. Thank you.